So our first speaker is Dr. Anya Nikustalva from the ESRI. She's a postdoctoral fellow in the ESRI in the Behavioral Economics Group. She did her PhD in Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience in Lancaster and previously had done her undergrad studies in Trinity. So Anya is going to speak to us with uh, the intriguing title, Baby Do, Baby See, Investigating Links Between Motor Development and Action Processing in Infancy. Yes, so uh, today I'm going to be speaking about some work I did as part of my PhD at Lancaster University on the relationship between motor development and infancy and how infants uh, come to understand other people's actions. Action is obviously quite a, a broad term, but something I find quite useful in terms of conceptualizing it uh, while I was doing this work is that it's the translation of internal states such as intentions into behavior that's often overt or communicative. So by overt, I mean uh, a physical action that actually affects some sort of change on the world, such as reaching to pick up a glass because one wants to drink or intends to drink. Um, and by communicative, on one level, that refers to specifically communicative actions like pointing and directing your gaze somewhere for someone else to follow that and share in, in, the, uh, in what you're looking at. But at the, on the uh, same level, uh, it's also about actions where, by virtue of actually performing the action, someone else gets insight into what your goals or what your intentions are. So you're essentially communicating something about what your intentions are. So on one level, people talk about action perception, which is simply, in some ways it's used quite broadly, but generally it refers to simply identifying an action as such, so something that is goal-directed, something that follows a specific structure. Um, but in general, when talking about this work, I prefer to use the term action processing, because in addition to simply identifying that a series of, of steps that follow one another are part of an action, we also are able to determine whether an action actually makes sense, whether it's congruent. So, sort of three broad themes that kind of united uh, the work I conducted uh, at Lancaster are sort of the social, motor, and semantic elements of action. And I will say that there are, of course, perceptual elements to action development. Um, I don't want to, to leave anybody out, but these particular themes, social, motor, and semantic, have a particular relationship to one another that was quite important in structuring this work. So when we talk about the social elements of action, on the one level, of course, we're talking about using social cues, following someone's gaze, um, sort of... Uh, learning about the environment by watching what other people are doing. But on the other level, we're also talking about learning to predict others' actions. By observing other people performing the same action over and over, eventually we learn what they will do in a certain context when using a certain tool, and so on. So uh, there's sort of more complex elements to it. In addition, in addition to that, there's this uh, idea that's quite common within developmental cognitive neuroscience about the fact that infants in a way, learn to map their own goals onto others' actions by constantly repeating the same action and seeing others perform, perform the same action. It allows the infant to infer this kind of equivalence between what they're doing and what the other person is doing, and therefore between their own intentions and the other person's intentions. So on the motor element, there's an idea that essentially developing a greater repertoire of actions that one's actually able to perform, that you could develop a better mental representation of those actions, and that through this mechanism, this is how infants learn to predict others' actions. This is how they learn to map their own goals onto other actions. So there's a motor element to this. And this formed quite a core part of the work I'm going to present here today. The idea that only by being able to perform a specific action does the infant gain insight into uh, what others are doing, which turns out not to be quite so accurate. And uh, finally, something that's sort of less well investigated, but it's still quite important, is the semantic element of action. So I actually include a non-developmental paper here, uh, Glenn Humphrey's work, um, because it's, it, it gives a nice conceptualization of the fact that there are different routes to action. We have a direct perception to action route, where simple visual recognition of an action and its goal elicits a certain kind of uh, representation of that action. But there's also a semantic element. This idea that actions, they are hi hierarchical. They are defined by the goal, and therefore, following repeated sort of associations between a particular action and a particular goal, eventually we learn not only to predict that action, but also we learn what actions make sense. Me picking up the glass and putting it on my head, it is a complete action, it has a goal, but it doesn't actually make very much sense. You're not really able to inf infer what my intentions are from it. It's quite incongruous. So the reason why these three themes come together when thinking about a developmental action 
It's because there are two kind of core ideas, uh, some relatively, relatively modern ideas, I suppose we can go back 30 years, 40 years and say that's quite modern. Um, these are the ideas of the mirror system and uh, also of, of early social cognition and theory of mind. So I'm sure most people are familiar with both of these concepts, the mirror system. Initially, people spoke about mirror neurons in relation to uh, primate research, where they found, or not primate, but well, monkey research, uh, that you have a similar pattern of activation in this particular neurons in uh, rhesus monkeys' motor cortex, premotor cortex, uh, that respond in a similar manner to actions that the, the uh, monkey performs and actions that they observe others perform. And there's this idea that there's sort of this, uh, this link, essentially, between action performance and action observation, that there's a commonality of process that's occurring during action performance that also occurs during action observation. And furthermore, if we think about action and early development of action in relation to social cognition, of course we're not seeing theory of mind in infants for one year of age, but at the same time it seems to, certain theorists would think that it, it lays the foundations for social cognition, that by initially being able to predict what another person is going to do, and then mapping that onto the infant's own experience performing the same action and their intentions when they do so, that this gives the infant something of an insight, but perhaps not the infant, but it lays the foundations uh, for them to later build on this sort of uh, you know, second order reasoning about other people's beliefs and so on. Uh, so just to go back to the three core themes, I'm going to go through a couple of very uh, fundamental uh, studies in relation to each of these that kind of illustrate the point a little bit better. So the first is some work by Amanda Woodward from back in the, the late 1990s, and this would be one of the, the most important papers in uh, developmental action. So she habituated six and also five-month-old infants uh, to actions where an actor repeatedly reached for a particular toy, so in this case for a ball. And then she showed the infants the same actor reaching for a different toy, and of course they dishabituated because the toy is different. And following that, uh, for other infants, she, uh, she, sh she showed them instead a change in the location of the ball and the location of the reach, and of course there was another condition where the bear would have been in the opposite location, and they didn't dishabituate to this. So this essentially illustrates that the infant is not necessarily just tracking the motor components of the action, they're tracking the goal of the action, what the, what the ac actor is actually reaching for. And following that, she, she uh, conducted another experiment in which a claw was used, and they didn't find the same effect for the claw. So people began to think about the infant's perception of this action or this scene as being specifically uh, motivated by the fact that they knew that an actor, an adult who had intentions, was performing this kind of action. Now, some more recent research has found that if you uh, familiarize the infant with the actor who is controlling the claw before conducting this kind of study, that you get a completely different pattern of results. You get something similar to the hand reaching for the toys, and that's simply because the infant has this representation of the claw as a tool that is used by the actor. So moving on to the motor elements. Um, a lot of research looks at infants' ability to perform a pincer grip or a precision grip, so a thumb to forefinger grip, uh, simply because this is one of the uh, big sort of motor change, well, there are many motor changes that occur in the first year, but this is one that's specifically related to, you know, goal-directed action. Walking is a big change, but unless someone specifically has a target that they're walking towards, it, it's not always uh, easy to define in terms of goal-directed action. But reaching and using a pincer grip is. So, what this this work by uh, Dan Prince and Asher Slaven, essentially what they did was they showed infants a hand reaching behind an intruder in either a wide aperture or a narrow aperture. So not even a, a sort of a precise grip, but simply a narrower aperture in the hand. And then they removed the occluder and looked at the infant's looking times to either the expected outcome, where the hand was holding a cup with the same sort of grip at which they were reaching, or an outcome in which they were holding it in, uh, in the opposite grip. So what they found was that at nine months, infants across the board will look longer at the unexpected outcome than the expected outcome. They're surprised by it. They don't predict it. But at six months, only those infants who can perform a thumb to finger grip will look longer at the unexpected than the expected outcome. Illustrating that something about the ability to perform a pincer grip is allowing them to represent the difference in these reaches or the differences in these conclusions to the action. And one key measure that's used in this field to look at uh, 
action perception and sort of uh, motor motor activation is the uh, the mu rhythm of the infant EEG. So in infants, this is a six to ten hertz rhythm that you pick up over central EEG channels. And people suggest that it's a correlate of the human mirror or the, the human mirror system because you see a similar uh, manifestation for both execution and observation of the same actions. And in fact, some recent research has shown that you get a different topography for uh, actions performed with the hand versus actions performed with the foot, as you might expect if you thought about the, uh, you know, the, the sensory motor homunculi. So this, uh, this study by Victoria Southgate and her colleagues really illustrates how even when we think about something as simple as, uh, what. Well, Perhaps the mirror system isn't simple, but when we think about you know, performing a simple action and about mapping the same movement, actually the, the presence of a goal is extremely important. So in this quite clever study, I think, they showed infants either a hand reaching behind an occluder in a grasping posture or one reaching behind the occluder in, in a non-grasping sort of incidental posture, so with the back of the hand. And in fact, uh, if we return to Amanda Woodward's paper with the hand reaching for the toys, she also found that when uh, you use a sort of a, an incidental hand posture, so something that's not grasping to inside the back of the hand posture, that you don't see these, uh, these dishabituation effects when the hand reaches for a different toy. So to, uh, to, to return to this paper, they also showed the, same, the exact same sort of motor movement but with no occluder. So if essentially when there's an occluder, one can infer that there is a, a toy behind it or something the person is reaching for. When there's no occluder, it's fairly definite that there's nothing there. And what they found was they only found, so we talk about mu desynchronization. So an increase in motor activation is essentially uh, an increase in mu desynchronization or a decrease in mu power. So it's, it's quite convoluted to think about, but essentially, this sort of uh, relative to baseline, they got more motor activation, which you'll see by the leftmost uh, bar here on the chart. That they got a great an increase in motor activation relative to a baseline where there was no movement, only for the action that was ostensibly goal directed. So this this idea that uh, if, when we think about motor activation in infancy, particularly in response to observed actions, that they are sensitive to what is a goal directed action and what is not. And just as a, a final example here. This uh, paper by Michelle van Elk and colleagues. What they did was they uh, they looked at infants who had different uh, stages of experience in terms of crawling experience and walking experience, and they looked at their motor activation in response to videos of other infants crawling and walking. And what they found, so you see, uh, the walking results, given that very few infants actually had very much walking experience, they would have been about fourteen months. So you would expect it there would be a little bit more walking experience, but not in the case of this sample. They simply looked at the crawling results. And what they found was that relative to the walking videos, the infants with more experience of crawling showed greater motor activation in response to the crawling videos. So this idea that the infants who had more experience of crawling uh, essentially showed greater motor activation, greater ability to map their representation of crawling onto the observed action uh, than those infants who had less experience of crawling. And they used walking as kind of a baseline in this case. So moving on to the final theme, semantics. There's less work done. This is, it's relatively recent to think about semantic processing of action in infancy. Um, but there's a growing field of literature. So we talk about semantics. We talk about something that's meaningful. So it's not just about make, forming an association between a particular tool and a particular action. It's about having a representation of that tool's function and being able to identify when an action simply, even though it might have a goal, when the goal does not cohere with the, with the other elements of the action. So I start by bringing up uh, the work of Shiva and, and Gerge on the teleological stance, which is a pretty consistent finding and some people might uh, take issue with me saying that this is about some action semantics, but essentially what they find is that in 9 and 12 month old infants, if you habituate them to an action, such as this one on the left, where a ball leaps over an occluder to touch another ball, so touching the other ball is the goal. If you subsequently show them either the, uh, with the occluder removed, 
the small ball form, following the exact same path or the small ball following a shorter path, what you actually find is that they look longer at the exact same movement when, uh, than at the, the new movement because the exact same movement is not uh, as directly uh, goal-oriented as the new movement. So there's a sensitivity to the idea that one only performs actions that make sense, that there's no, that uh, actions that are goal-directed follow an, an efficient path. No, in, in these cases it's simply about balls moving and this sort of thing. So, um, yes, yeah, so there, there's certainly a lot of debate about it. Uh, there, there actually, perhaps a better example would have been another paper by Victoria Southgate where she showed a hand reaching through a series of occluders to touch a ball and the hand could either uh, follow uh, an efficient or inefficient path and it could move in a way that you'd expect a hand to move or you could see these sort of uh, additional bends in the arm that aren't biomechanically possible and again they find this sort of efficiency, uh, this focus on efficiency, this sort of coding actions by their goals and the most efficient way to get to the goal um, stands, although sometimes the infants will have increased interest in things that are biomechanically unusual. So, the, uh, so action semantics, it can be hard with infants if we want to think of something as, or we want to see if they're encoding something as semantic, because in many ways, yes, they will look longer at something that's incongruous, but they'll also look longer at something that's unfamiliar. So it's, uh, it, it can be quite hard to, to disentangle these things. So one way of doing this is looking at uh, particular ERP, the N400, which is associated with semantic processing. So you get a larger N400 uh, when you, for example, are listening to a sentence and someone includes a, a verb that doesn't make sense. So the famous example uh, from Marta Kutas is the pizza is too hot to cry instead of the pizza is too hot to eat. Um, so you'll get a, a, a larger deflection, negative deflection, about 400 milliseconds post stimulus uh, for the, uh, the the part of the sequence, whether that's a word in a sentence or an action that doesn't make sense. So in this particular example from Sitnikova and colleagues, they showed um, a lot of adults action sequences in which there were defined steps. So picking up a breadboard, placing bread on the board. And then they would either show people an action conclusion that made sense, someone using a knife to cut the bread, or something that does not make sense. So an incongruous tool is used, the iron is used to cut the bread or to act, perform some action on the bread. And what you see in adults is this um, frontal uh, negative deflection around 400 milliseconds post stimulus um, that is strong, larger to incongruous stimuli than congruous stimuli. So bringing this back to infants, uh, at nine months, there is some evidence that you have this uh, N400 emerging fractions that don't make sense. So here you've got a goal-directed action, the woman puts the bread in her mouth. Here, here is one that's incongruous, but goes still goal-directed, she puts the bread on her head. And what's interesting in this case, it's a good example of what's quite different between uh, infant ERPs and adult ERPs, uh, is that they're much noisier and Sometimes things are a little bit more difficult to define. So in this case, in fact, the effect was found over uh, parietal electrodes um, rather than frontal electrodes. But there are multiple reasons why this might happen. You might have there's there are other strong components that you see in infants in relation to these kinds of stimuli, which I'll talk about in a moment, that may have pushed the effect back. Um, and indeed, you also have a developmental difference, which means that certain uh, the topography of ERPs can be quite different for infants than for adults. Um, so in this case, what you'll also notice, notice is that the uh, so negative is plotted up. You'll see that the, N4, the negative response for the congruous stimulus is actually more negative, but it's a single, not very well-defined peak. So what they did was they did a, an analysis where they took into account various time bins, and they found that you get a negative deflection, not necessarily an overall more negative response, but ne negative deflection at the appropriate time after the stimulus that seems to be homologous, homologous to uh, the N400 in adults, and this has been replicated in studies with older children about two to three years of age. So a final element of action semantics that I'll just run through quite quickly is uh, the P400. So this is a, an infant-specific component, uh, whereas the infant N400 you generally see about 600 to 800 milliseconds post-stimulus because things tend to be a little bit slower in the infant brain. You have a uh, P400 is actually at 400 milliseconds, 
post stimulus. It's oh, you see it over posterior electrodes, and it's it's quite ill defined at the moment. Initially, it was very well defined as a part of a, a sort of a two stage component that was responsive to face stimuli. So you'd see an N290 response, and then you'd see a P2 P400 response. Um, but in recent years, a lot of research has shown that it's also responsive to social stimuli, such as pointing hands. And in the case of this particular study by Mark Backer and colleagues, what they found was that, uh, yeah, they found a larger P400 when they showed infant stimuli such as balls, and they were followed by a hand that was reaching towards the ball or the toy that they'd just seen versus hands that were reaching away in a grasping posture. And this replicates work that was done with pointing fingers. So this idea that the there's an anticipation that the uh, the toy or whatever has just appeared will be signaled uh, by a sort of a socially communicative uh, stimulus. So what they also what's kind of crucial in this point is that they looked at whether the the five month olds who participated in their research could perform power grasps if they could reach for and grasp uh, small toys, and they found that uh, essentially. The difference in the P400 response to the, the congruous versus the incongruous reaches with the grasping hand, uh, the difference was larger for those infants who were better at performing those grasps. And you can also see there's an age-related effect as well. But at five months, you see it's very much determined by the infant's ability to actually perform that, that grasp and that reach themselves. So when we talk about action experience in relation to uh, both uh, perception and uh, processing and performance of actions, there's certain elements that need that are not quite as well defined as they could be. So for example, when we talk about action experience, in some cases, in some studies, people talk about actions in general. Is it, is it that the ability to perform an action and understand that uh, when someone enacts some sort of change on the world, it's motivated by the fact that they also understand the general structure that that sort of semantic or hierarchical structure of action, or is it about understanding specific actions? And of course, there are other questions that arise. Is it, is it something that the more experience that one has, the better one is able to do this? Or is it that you know the simple ability to perform a pencil grip opens up uh, a new ability to represent different actions? So the sort of larger research question in this field is, What's the relationship between action perception and action production in infancy? But within this work, I was particularly interested in semantic processing of action and if this ability to uh, perform actions and understand them as sort of goal-directed, multi-step uh, entities would affect whether infants are able to semantically process actions. And the uh, additional question was about the relationship between action experience and semantic processing for tool using actions. And the reason why we focused on tools um, is that in many ways you can have the exact same tool stimulus, but the way in which the person interacts with the tool, the way in which a grasp is enacted on that tool, fundamentally transforms what the sort of semantics of that action are. So, you know, in the case of these two first images here, the, 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 the position at which the person holds the tool alters the level of sort of precision that they're going to be performing that action with and alters what we might anticipate that the action is going to be. And likewise, if someone uses a completely different grasp or holds the tool in a different orientation, it also alters what we expect that action to be. So one of the, when we think about tools in relation to infants, that ones that they have experience with, we do think about uh, things related to eating. And there's a some of descriptive research on uh, precisely what infants can do at different ages, and therefore what we might investigate when we're looking at different ages. So at nine months, infants, they make errors when they're eating. So one common error is to grasp the wrong end of the spoon and place the handle in the mouth, potentially because there's an association between a spoon and eating, but not necessarily an understanding of how to use that tool. At 14 months, they'll, they'll have some success at grasping the handle correctly and putting the, the food in the mouth that there is an element of planning that's occurring. Uh, but they still make a number of errors. And at 19 months, they'll grasp the handle correctly with their preferred hand. So in many cases, for example, at 14 months, they might grasp the handle the wrong way and then try to put the food in their mouth in, in an awkward way, whereas at 19 months, they can fully plan the action. They have a, a good representation of that action. So when we think about the semantics of tool use, we are thinking about the relationship between motor processes and semantic processes. So 
One example of this is um, this work by Janice Stappel and colleagues, where they found that uh, if you showed infants actions that proceeded as normal or actions that ended a little bit strangely, what you see is that yes, you have motor activation in response to the congruous action, but as opposed to the crawling research where infants who didn't have any experience of crawling didn't show any motor activation in response to the crawling videos or showed very little relative to the infant support experience. In this case, when it's an action that the infant can perform but simply doesn't make sense, you have an even larger degree of motor activation. So this is quite an important implication for when we think about the importance of action experience for understanding actions. So uh, we don't see any motor activation when the infant simply has no representation of the action in, in question. We see some when the infant has a representation. And when it's something where the infant can potentially perform the same action and has an understanding of how the action should go, but now has to map a different kind of action onto that existing representation, we see the most motor activation. So the first of my own studies that I'm going to discuss is one uh, that's based on some work by uh, Marcus Paulus and colleagues, where they found that at 20 but not at 14 months, infants could use the means in which an actor grasped the same tool. So if you see this actor is using this sort of hammer looking thing, if they grasp it over the top, the infants at 20 months, so I suppose young toddlers, were able to predict, uh, that, you know, it would be used on this key-like object, and uh, if they gripped it by the handle, they could predict that it would be used as a bell, but the 14 month olds could not do this. So what we thought was that perhaps infants simply have no association between this, at the, the start of the study, and indeed it's quite a short study, about 12 trials, that they simply have no exposure to actually what the function of that tool is. So the ability to uh, not only integrate the sort of novel hand-based uh, information, but also to integrate that and update a representation of a goal is quite challenging. So we wanted to see whether prior exposure to goal information um, would facilitate their encoding of this sort of dual function tool. So we created our own dual function tool and two fairly similar uh, objects in which it would be uh, used. In one case, the blue hook would be used to pull the yellow band from one vertical post to the next. In the other case, the blue hook would be used to lift the red band from one horizontal post to the next horizontal post. We then familiarized infants with two different actors. So, based on a lot of other research, infants tend to associate specific actions with specific action actors in a specific context. And having one actor perform two different actions can make it quite challenging for them to, uh, to predict the action. So we had two separate actors, each of which consistently had a specific uh, goal that they would perform with the action. So they would hold the tool in a certain orientation, I know it's quite hard to see with the, with the light, and perform one of the two specific actions. And then uh, before each critical trial, we would show the actor expressing interest in the uh, in the object that they were going to perform the action on. This has been used in, in previous work. And then we'd show them a critical stimulus with the actor either holding the tool in the orientation that matched her goal or the orientation that, missed, that did not match her goal. And uh, just to give an idea of the challenges of infant research, so we tested 34 infants uh, in the first study and uh, we lost a number due to either them not paying attention to the stimuli for a sufficient amount of time, or due to issues with the eye tracker with the infant eyes, it can often be hard for an eye tracker to pick them up. And we, uh, in response to reviewer comments, we we did we replicated the same study with some minor differences in the videos in terms of whether, uh, essentially, in the first one, you saw the actor pick up the tool and then turn to use it. In the second video, it simply saw the use of the tool by the actor. And um, uh, a slightly smaller sample, but the results were replicated. So essentially what we found with these videos here, we divided them into uh, areas of interest that included the face, the upper end of the tool, and the lower end of the tool. So we were looking not only at the infant's ability to determine whether the orientation of the tool matched the uh, intention of the actor, but also uh, whether they were particularly interested in the, in the hook that matched the actor's intention. And essentially what we found was that um, the infants had very little interest in the tools relative to the face. Even these were 16-month-olds. We, uh, for pragmatic reasons, we, we didn't use 14-month-old infants. We used infants between 15 and a half and 16 and a half months for the study. Um, and yet yeah, we found that there were, they had very little interest in the tools and these static images. They were more interested in the actors' faces. Um, but what we did find was that 
in the case of the tool where the actor was holding it upside down relative to her intention, we found that um, essentially the infants were more interested in the incongruent hook than the uh, than the, the congruent hook. We also found in this first study that they were more interested in the upright tool end, which you might anticipate because they understand that the tool is going to be used in a specific way and the upper end of the tool is closer to the actor's face. Um, so essentially we found that although the infants didn't necessarily care about how the actors were holding the tools, they were interested in the fact that in one case the actor appeared to be holding the, uh, the wrong end of the tool upright. And this is replicated in a, in a second version of this, uh, of this study. So essentially what this tells us is that the infants simply associated a particular end of the tool with particular action. They didn't care about how the actor was holding the tool, they didn't encode uh, whether it was being held upright or upside down, so to speak. Um, so it kind of indicates that when infants are learning about novel tools, that the precise relationship between the hand and the tool and the precise means of grasping the tool is not particularly important. So it's not necessarily just the case that the 14-month-olds found the, uh, the different means of grasping the tool too difficult to encode. It seems that simply when, when a novel tool is in play, they're attentive to the, the functional end of the tool as opposed to the function of the actor's movements. So moving on to the, uh, the sort of very directly semantic work. We looked at whether infants exhibit N400 and P400 responses that differentiate between congruent and incongruent grasps and familiar objects. So whether they actually pay attention to how a familiar object is held as opposed to a novel object. And uh, in this case, we, we used actions, uh, which I'll show in a moment, that the way in which the tool was held didn't necessarily prevent the action being performed, but it didn't necessarily match the shape of the, of the object. So it's not necessarily about a grasping functional or non-functional, it's about it matching the infant's representation of how they might grasp and use that object. And uh, we also looked at infant's fine motor skills in relation to these, uh, to these components to see if actually having a representation of the particular grasp that were used uh, facilitated infants in encoding the differences between these kinds of grasp. So what we essentially, we showed uh, single images in a sequence um, because that, for practical reasons it's easier to uh, compute event related potentials from EEG when they're to a particular instance of a stimulus appearing. So we'd show actors uh, sitting at a table with, we had, you know, each cup in different colors, either a cup with a handle, or two, with two handles, or a cup without handles. Um, and we showed the actor reaching for uh, the tool. And then the final critical stimulus, we showed the actor grasping the tool. So either they were using a, a more precise grip, congruently, so over the handle, or they were grasping around the round edge, edge of the non-handled cup with this sort of precision grip, which would be relatively incongruous when one thinks about how one would usually hold a glass like that, particularly as an infant. Um, and then we also looked at, uh, we also used the whole hand grasp, so the, the, uh, the whole hand around the round edge, or the whole hand over the handle in a relatively incongruous grasp. So initially we did it with uh, some adults, some students, uh, just to determine what the response would be in adults, because this sort of thing had not necessarily been done before. Generally when people look at the uh, the congruence of grasp. They're looking at actions where the grasp prevents or facilitates the performance of the action. So initially we looked at this N170, which would be the adult version of the P400, this sort of initially thought to be face-specific, now seems to be related to uh, sort of the, uh, the communicativeness or the social elements of a particular uh, stimulus. And we didn't find any effects there, but what we did find was over the front essential region, as one would expect, we found uh, an effect of congruence. We didn't find an effect of grasp type. So you can see over here, it does appear that uh, the effects are uh, stronger for the, the uh, power than the pincer grip, but there was no significant effect of that. But essentially between 400 and 600 milliseconds here, you can see this large peak that is the, the N400. So essentially, the adults did seem to process the incongruous grasps as incongruous. So again, with the difficulties of working with, uh, with infants, we had 39-month-old infants, of which 15 we were able to retain based on how many, uh, how many trials we were able to, uh, to get from each infant's data. So they'll sit for 65 trials, 64 trials. They might only attend to half of those. And of course, due to blinks, to moving, 
uh, and that sort of thing, you end up with even fewer trials. So these were infants between about eight and a half to nine and a half months, corresponding to the infants where they found the uh, the N400 effect with the in response to the eating stimuli in that previous study. So initially, we looked at this NC effect, which simply encodes what, whether the infant uh, directs their attention more strongly to one sort of stimulus than the other. And we did uh, we looked at it uh, bilaterally, so you generally see this front to centrally in infants. Um, a lot of other papers will find lateralized effects for this component, um, and some won't. So we we thought we'd cover all bases. And essentially, although it looks like there is an effect of laterality, infant data is notoriously uh, noisy. Uh, it's just the way just the way the uh, the infant data turns out to be. But you can see. At least on the, the, the left, you can see this very strong uh, negative component in response to the incongruent stimulus rather to the con congruent stimulus. But as I said, there is no effect of laterality. This is incidental. I'm sure my plot of the standard errors, you can see the, the difference. So uh, we also looked for the N400 effect. Essentially, that NC effect shows that they paid more attention to the incongruent stimulus. But with the N400, we found no effect. And um, you'd expect to see it, I suppose, where, uh, around 600 to 800 milliseconds post stimulus, but we found no significant effects. However, we did find a significant T400 effect, um, so we we had this uh, response between about 350 and 500 milliseconds, 300, 300 and 600 milliseconds post stimulus, um, which was larger again to the incongruous stimulus. So, given that. Um, this, this component which appears in infants to be sensitive to the sort of the communicativeness of, uh, of the stimulus. It seems as though the fact that a familiar grasp was not enacted on the cup seems to have primed them to uh, attend to this as something that maybe was going to have a further social significance, something that they could learn from. So we also, we moved up to 11 to 12 month olds because we were surprised that we didn't see this N400 effect to see if we could get the effect with them. And uh, there was no NC and no P400 effect with this group, and there was no N400 effect either. So, again, infant data is notoriously messy. Even though these uh, appear to diverge, there's actually no significant effect there. Again, if I plotted the standard errors, you'd see that they, they overlap quite strongly. So, we did do uh, a comparison of this peak that occurs between about 550 and 700 milliseconds post stimulus, a little bit earlier than the nine month olds, as you'd expect as the infants get older. Um, to see if it was a significant peak relative to baseline. Of course it was, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything without a, a comparison where we have no N400 effect found. Um, but it, it may simply be that at this age, the, uh, the infants are, are thinking about the actions in a different manner. So initially, the, the, the NC effect and the P400 effects suggest that they do initially perceive the differences in how these hands are interacting with the cups. Um, but as, for example, as shown in the previous studies, they develop a semantic representation of action around nine months. Perhaps they're focused solely on the goals, which are the most important part of the action hierarchy. So we did adapt some measures from the Bailey Scales of Infant Development to look at uh, infant's ability to use thumb forefinger opposition, um, corresponding to, for example, the, the Backer study and the Mark Stem study, where they looked at whether infants could perform uh, particular grasps, and if that, and they found that this affected their ability to uh, to process these sorts of grasping actions. But in our case, we found no relationships at all between the grasping ability and the uh, the size of the uh, the components that we found. So yeah, essentially, this sort of suggests a U-shaped developmental trajectory that needs a little bit more investigation to determine exactly when the uh, the nine month old's initial sensitivity to the difference in these grasps why that d diminishes and when that returns to uh, in adulthood to have this sort of semantic encoding of whether the grasp actually matches the object or not. So, uh, and again, we found no relationship to motor skill, which is quite surprising, uh, given the, the results from other studies, but perhaps given that this is a sort of a, a different kind of action, it's about the relationship between the hand and the object, perhaps there's action-specific experience that we should be measuring as opposed to overall ability to perform pins and grips. And uh, finally, uh, this work is still, we've still got some analyses um, going with this particular work in order to clarify some of the results. It was conducted at uh, Redbird University in Nijmegen with Sabina Honeyus and Sarah Gerson. And we looked at nine, ten month olds' uh, mutisynchronization, so the activation of their mirror system, 
in response to actions that are completely identical in terms of the motor aspect. So like that Victoria Southgate study with the reach of the hand uh, behind the occluder, but that differ semantically. So the meaning of the action, the, uh, the ability to achieve the goal differs. And we also looked at, in this case, instead of looking at simple performance of particular motor skills, we looked at their ability to plan actions. So essentially we showed them actors, again with the head cut off, it's just that faces and eyes tend to be a little bit too interesting. If you leave them in, you'll get very different uh, patterns of looking. Um, we used three different actors, uh, they each used their left and right hands, and the spoons in front of them are oriented in different directions, so you know, towards the right hand or away from the right hand. And of course we also included different food on the spoon just to maintain the interest. Um, so in the video the actor reaches for the spoon, grasps the spoon and eats from it. But in half of the videos, the actor will reach for the spoon in a way that will sort of facilitate eating from the spoon. So we use these whole hand grasps because, of course, they would be more familiar for the infants. Half the videos, they use the exact same grasp, but the spoon is oriented in the other direction. And essentially that means that the way that the action concludes uh, differs quite, quite substantially. So what we hypothesized was that infants who had greater experience of planning actions um, would show a difference in motor activation in response to these two stimuli. Similarly to the, the cup study I showed earlier, we anticipated that uh, essentially those infants with, uh, would show greater activation to this lower stimulus because while they, they know what the function of the spoon is, they can perform this particular action themselves. They would be able to anticipate that based on their representation of performing that action, that this is going to end in a slightly different way to how they would uh, usually conclude an action. And we hypothesized that with all infants uh, across the board, we'd see a difference in motor activation to the, in response to the, the typical action and the atypical and um, slightly more difficult action. Where again, we have greater activation in response to this uh, stimulus because even though the infants can perform that action and can sort of adjust their representation of the upper action to accommodate this lower action, um, the, you know, the, the, essentially updating the prediction requires greater motor activation. We also looked at the infant's own uh, ability to perform the exact same action, so their parents would bring in food for them and we'd have them pick up spoons in different orientations and record how many touches they, they perform on the spoon before picking it up, uh, how many times they transfer the spoon between hands, so if they picked it up incorrectly would they transfer it to a different hand before bringing it in the mouth, how many trials that they performed completely correctly from the beginning to the end, so just picking it up directly in the mouth and eating from it, how many trials where they didn't pick up the spoon, how many trials where they didn't eat from the spoon, and how many trials where they essentially put the spoon in their mouth the wrong way around. So in terms of the, the, the mu synchronization results, we didn't find any effects of action congruence across the board at all. Across the board, infants did not seem to attend to these differences in how the action was performed. Um, but what we did find was this sort of uh, rebound effect. So we've got greater motor activation, uh, which is a greater decrease in mu power uh, before the grasp is enacted on the spoon that then uh, is significantly different relative to baseline. So baseline was an abstract image um, just looking at general uh, neural activation in this sort of alpha band between 5 and 9 hertz uh, relative to these actions. So we see this sort of rebound where essentially they're in anticipation and prediction of the action they're showing motor activation, and once the action is performed, um, that rebounds. In terms of the eating action, we didn't see these same effects. So we, we, we essentially split the, split the action into reaching to grasp, so the grasp being goal one, and then eating, putting the spoon in the mouth being goal two. So uh, also some, some maps these show just, we only had 14 infants for this analysis. We tested 32, but based on data quality issues, we ended up with 14, which Again, it would be quite typical, but I think what these really illustrate is the difficulty of making any inferences from 14 infants, particularly when you've got very different experiential uh, uh, levels. And in fact, if it, to an extent, it also indicates that perhaps looking at a, a lower frequency or a higher frequency band, the beta band, which is also associated with motor activation, perhaps would have been uh, more fruitful, but it's not very well defined in infancy and it's a little bit controversial. So in terms of the, uh, the planning behavior, Given that we didn't find any uh, congruence-based effects, we didn't want to make any uh, big inferences. But we did a couple of exploratory correlations between those uh, motor abilities and the, uh, the difference in their responses to the congruent and incongruent actions. So essentially, uh, what we found was that in this period after the action is concluded, when the spoon is in the mouth, those infants who uh, 
were better able to perform the action correctly from start to finish, it showed a larger response to the incongruous than the congruous action. Those infants who were uh, unable, so essentially the, the number of trials in which they failed to uh, perform the eating action with the spoon uh, was co uh, negatively correlated with this difference between the incongruent and congruent action. So it suggests really that this age group is potentially a little bit too young, their level of experience with self-feeding with spoons might be a little bit too low in order to, uh, to glean uh, effective results. But essentially this gestures at, very tentatively pending for further work, the fact that uh, when we talk about action experience in terms of understanding action, we're really talking about the ability to, to plan specific, well, to plan actions as opposed to specific sort of uh, motor changes and motor ability. So, again, yeah, there are no differences in alpha D synchronization in relation to action congruence at any stage of the action. It's a tentative link between the ability to plan action and difference in activation to congruent versus incongruent action. Um, and uh, sort of in conclusion, what we see in early development is that action semantics does not include the means of grasping a tool to perform an action. It seems to be results so far indicate that the focus is on the goal of the action, the, the overall structure of the action. And that the links between experience and identification of congruence hinge more on the planning of action than the performance of specific signals. So I'd just like to uh, give some thanks to my supervisors and to my colleagues who uh, assisted me with some of this research, and to the uh, the European Commission who funded this uh, this work as part of the uh, of an FP7 FP7 Marie Curie uh, initial training network called ACT. So I'm happy to take any questions. Very superficial question, I'm afraid, um, and you may be helping me out with the conversation I have with my mum about table manners and my children. Yeah. <laughs> she thinks that children um, have, don't have as good table manners nowadays because their parents don't sit with them to for them to see them eating. And um, I have a one-year-old at home that I'm trying to teach her to eat, and I, and I don't sit with him to. To, to show him how I'm eating my own and I'm expecting him to kind of start doing that. But does that make a difference? Do, you, you're talking about the, the mirror neurons. The, do they need to actually have seen the action before they're actually engaging in the action themselves? And your study is sort of suggesting that the two are... Well, yeah, so yeah. Uh, in terms of thinking about, about whether uh, like mirror system function is based on associate, associations that are formed or whether it's an aid that taps into a massive massive debate that people get very serious about. But uh, yeah, essentially I suppose that it is a it is a two-way street. I suppose a lot of the research might indicate that particularly for tool use actions, infants learn from the affordance of the tool and from performing the action and having successful or non-successful outcomes. Um, whereas observation of others is more about learning to map one's own experience of performing that that action and using that tool in that way onto um, other people in order to infer their intentions rather than specifically learning by imitation or learning by observation. But there is other work um, where people have used these kinds of new tools with multiple hooks and multiple functions that find that, yes, of course you get this massive difference between the performance of infants who've seen someone perform something with that new tool and those who haven't. So I suppose it's a bit of column A and of column B. Right, can't get off the hook <laughs> Just to follow up on that, um, it seems quite complex work, and I was really struck by the difference between tasks that you might consider a bit artificial, like using you know a hook to pull it the ring from here to there, and grasping a cup, or the lovely slide of someone ending putting a cup on their head rather than drinking from it. Would you feel like one paradigm is better than the other? I mean, I was very drawn to the more naturalistic movements, I suppose. Yeah, I think the naturalistic... So, you know, initially we had started with these novel tools, um, but the, the level of research in that domain is, is quite quite small at the moment because it is quite... Some people do some very fascinating stuff, but generally with older children, because the infant needs to learn what the tool does, yeah. and then you need to impose your experimental manipulations. So, and certainly there's motivational elements that are pragmatic where an infant is going to be interested in someone eating because that's quite a salient action for them. They might be, not be so interested in, in someone doing something quite abstract. Um, but certainly, of course, there would then the, the reason why one might use a novel tool is that infants are going to have 
certain levels of experience depend. You know, we actually have great variability in the infants who came into the study, uh, the last study there, where some parents had said the infant had never eaten from a spoon before, and this was their first opportunity to do so, uh, or you know, self-fed from a spoon before. And um, these were nine to eleven month old infants. So, um, yeah. So if you if you really want to separate out that experiential element, which can often be quite important in determining whether this is something that's based on associations, whether it's based on observation, whether it's based on actually experience of doing the thing. The novel tools are quite useful in that regard. So it depends on what your aim is. Um, do you consider that the representation is mostly action predictive or semantic at the younger age? At the younger age, it's going to be predictive. I mean, the, the idea of semantic processing of action People really haven't found much evidence for it before nine months. In language, you see some evidence a little bit earlier, but for action, it tends to be a bit later. So really, it's about forming these associations between the action and the or the you know the tool that's used or the person that's doing the action and the conclusion of that action. Forming an association eventually that's so strong that one can predict it, and then later there's sort of a such a strong association between particular tool and what is to be done with that tool and what the outcome is and what the outcome means in terms of the infant's own goals and intentions, that it becomes a sort of a semantic representation. But of course this is speculation, no one has really looked at that. We try to look at that transition to an extent, but it requires a lot more a lot more work, a lot more manipulations. A random question, yeah, you mentioned uh, in the baby's spoons and counting how many times they touch them. Do you notice what hand they usually touch? So this is this is a compelling question because there's so many there's so much debate over uh, laterality in infancy. So this is some analysis that we might look at. Um, certainly with the McCarty and Clifton and Coloured work that it was based on, um, they they found that there wasn't necessarily any evidence of a hand preference early. But uh, anecdotally, this needs to be analysed. But it seems as though with these infants who were between 9 and 11 months, that uh, the hand that was successful for the first time was repeated. Repeated, okay. But uh, this is anecdotal. It needs to be analyzed in detail. And is that why people make two-handle cups for babies? You know, just from Potentially, and also the, yeah. the ability to reach across the body is actually relatively late in developing, so it, it might be easier for them if something is double affordance. I heard a, a researcher, Tim Smith, talking recently at a conference about children's television, and he said how um, he theorized that it, it, it acted to scaffold their attention to social information because things like text movies are really bizarre sorts of things for adults to look at. And he compared it to the idea of mother ease and the way there you would scaffold children's language learning through these kind of exaggerated expressions or simplified expressions. I'm wondering if there is implications for guiding children's motor learning through not the more precise actions, but exaggerated versions of them or different versions of them. Yes, certainly. Um, you do see some research on mother ease in relation to uh, parents performing uh, actions with their children. And Linda Smith has some fascinating stuff where she's um, she's put video cameras on the heads of the parents and the infants and looked at how the the parents behave in relation to the infant, and there is this idea of exaggeration. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly, I don't know necessarily about uh, video instruction of motor development, but certainly it does seem that those uh, TV programs that are best for child development that seem to actually have potential positive effects are those that are very engaging. So potentially. And they can focus on some bizarre repetition of certain yeah, actions yeah. as well. I'm also thinking of the airplane coming in to give the food is a very exaggerated Yeah, method. yeah. It's putting the spoon in your mouth. So potentially okay. there could be something about grasping the spoon in a very exaggerated way. Well, could I ask you, you have a lot of eye tracking data. Did you think of looking through cubometry measures? So, some people have done this in relation to infant work, um, but the, the methods for doing so, I'm not completely familiar with, but yes, pupillometry, pupil dilation in infants is associated with uh, surprise. So essentially one could use that as a measure so in addition certainly, to looking time. You could check your mu and your M400 yeah. with, uh, the, the, uh, with the attentional processes occurring just at that point. Yeah, I haven't thought about doing that, looking at dilation yes. exactly at those points yeah. in time. 
So it would be, regardless of whether it's infants or adults, it would be a nice validation. Yeah. Which could be a methodological. Yeah. Right? yeah it tells sure. us a lot about pupillometry as well. Yeah. yeah, some people are definitely working on pupillometry in infancy. Um, but as with all emerging methods, people are taking different approaches. Have we? Okay, folks, I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, stop. I'd like to thank Anya for a fascinating paper, and uh, it'll be continuing in discussion form with Nula at a social level for anyone who's interested. So, thanks very much.